because we're doing so much of it using technology, we don't have to have an analyst in the mix on every single market doing every single part of it. So we can have this sort of very thin human layer. We just crossed a thousand technology markets. We think there's probably in the neighborhood of three to 4,000 end technology markets that people care about. And so we can just infinitely scale as long as we continue to be able to acquire more data and qualitative information about companies and markets. Welcome to Media Empires, where we sit down with the most influential media creators right now to learn exactly how they built their empires. Our aim is to extract the secrets of top tier podcasters, newsletter authors, and media creators who are breaking the old rules for media success. Whether you're looking to start your own empire or simply curious about the nuts and bolts behind media businesses, you'll find valuable insights and tactics in each episode. Grab your headphones, let's dive in. Riverside is a presenting sponsor of Media Empires. It's an essential part of our tech stack. Riverside makes scaling a media business possible for us and so many podcasters and creators. It's our online recording studio, not just for the show, but across the entire podcast network. Riverside lets us record interviews with the best guests from wherever they are in the world. Our team can also cut short form clips directly from Riverside, because as any listener of the show knows, you create once and then publish everywhere. Sign up for Riverside.fm today by following the link in the description box and use our code Media Empires to get a 20% discount. Anand Sanwal is the founder and CEO of data company CB Insights with industry giant customers like NEA, Upfront, and Cisco. Over 900,000 people turn to CB Insights for the insights they share in their newsletter. Prior to founding CB Insights, Sanwal managed the $50 million Chairman Innovation Fund and American Express. Join us for a masterclass on media verticals and leveraging data to grow your business. Here's Anand. Anand, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining. Good to see you, Eric. So Anand, I'm, I'm lucky to have you on Media Empires, uh, and you certainly have an empire, but one of the things you make sure to clarify is that it's, it's not primarily a media company. Why don't you unpack it, what that means and, and why that's important? So CB Insights, we think of ourselves and we are a data and a SaaS company, right? I think we have elements of media in terms of how we go to market. Right. We have a very popular newsletter. We publish a lot of free research. And so that's been a way to lower cost of customer acquisition and build the brand. But you know, when I think of media, I think of advertising and I think of sponsored content and a whole number of other SKUs. And we don't have any of those. So I think yeah, our, our business is, you know, ninety-nine point nine percent subscription, annual recurring revenue, one year, multi year contracts. So pretty different, I'd say, in revenue composition. Let, let, let's get into your business and then we'll zoom out at large. CB Insights, you guys do a lot of things. You've done a lot of things over the, over the past decade. I want you to talk about what you are today and then maybe trace the evolution of, of how you got there, things you tried that you've discarded, et cetera. Why don't you give us some, some of that journey? Yeah, sure thing. Let me start at a high level with where we are today, and then maybe you know we can we can jump into where we started. You know, so at a high level, we're building a technology marketplace that connects a few folks in what we call the tech economy. So that's buyers, sellers, investors, and advisors. The idea is help them discover each other and technology-driven insights they need. We do that in a number of ways. We try to essentially think of us, we try to synthesize, analyze, and visualize a lot of qualitative and quantitative data about what we describe as the tech economy. And our general view is that there's a lot of friction in this economy. And so by bringing information to bear, our hope is it increases transparency and then folks can actually make quicker, more confident decisions and the goal being transact with each other. So a buyer for us represents somebody who's a technology buyer at like a large enterprise. It could be a corp dev team who's buying a company. It could be an investor who's buying equity. So we think of the buying side as it's quite expansive, I guess is the best way to put it. And then the sell side for us is the technology vendors. And so this is across sectors and across geographies. And then in this world, there's a whole ecosystem of advisors. So that could be consultants or investment banks and advisors, sundry advisors of, of various types. So that's kind of the business at a high level. If it's helpful, I can dig into a, a specific example and, and show you how that works. Yeah, that'd be great, please. Yeah, let's look at a space, right? So we'll take AML KYC, right? So this is anti-money laundering and, and KYC is know your customer, right? So there's lots of people, lots of organizations who need these capabilities, right? There's retail banks, there's payment companies, there's wealth management firms, there's government agencies, there's insurers, and each of them has like their own needs. Some of them want to be on-prem, some of them want to be in the cloud. So you have all these factors in this market. And then what you have is 
even within this broader AML, KYC kind of enterprise need that exists, it's not this sort of one monolithic market. Think of that as like the parent market, and then there's all these children underneath it, right? So underneath that, there's transaction monitoring systems, sanction screening, fraud detection, KYC compliance, right? And you can spit off a ton of these children. What that all means, kind of irrespective of whether you understand you know, KYC, AML, is that it's this really messy and noisy technology space. And so if we're looking or if we're talking to or have a customer who's a retail bank, or many retail banks, the reality is that those banks come to us and they, they come to us at different levels of sophistication and maturity on these specific problems, right? And so they go on this journey, right? And so what we try to provide is on-ramps to a bank kind of and meet them where they are. If you think of technology decisions, they go through this framework we call the three Ds. There's discovery, there's design, and then there's decision. And so some bank might come to us and say, hey, listen, like AML, KYC has become like a board priority and we're really behind. And so they're at what we call the discovery phase, like, you know, what's going on? And so for, th for them, it's giving them, you know, a market report, a market map, a landscape of who the players are. It's really high level. And then we might have somebody else who comes to us and says, hey, listen, I need to buy something in the a transaction monitoring system space, and I just need to make a decision on who I should do this with. And so our goal is to then, for them, give them vendor scorecards. We have interviews with software buyers. We do briefings with companies. And so irrespective of where you are, we're trying to help you then make that decision. So that's one example. And then we do that for, you know, over a thousand different technology markets. And so that's how a retail bank or a hospital system, or you name it, or a cross sector, would use CB Insight. A thousand you know different saying? markets. How do you achieve that level of, of, of scale? Yeah. So the big thing here is it's like heavily machine learning and now, you know, increasingly AI driven, right? We have data that comes in through three kind of main sources. So our roots are sort of machine intelligence, which is crawling unstructured sources. So this would be regulatory filings, press releases, websites, etc. We'd build company profiles. And that's the way we did it for basically the first, we'll call it 75% of CBI's life. Then what ended up happening, and this is maybe where the media part has had benefits for us, because of our newsletter, companies increasingly were willing to contribute data to us. They wanted to be featured in a market map. They knew that you know, most of the large banks and large healthcare firms were using us. So they wanted to be in front of those customers. So the second piece we've added probably in the last two and a half years has been this contributory data network where companies do briefings with us. Those briefings are fully automated and they're giving us a ton of information about themselves and about their competition. Most of that data is what we call off the grid, right? It, it's not something we could extract with machine learning because it's not out in the public domain in any way. And it's not even in the semi-public domain. And then the third is we go and interview buyers of these softwares. And we know that technology buyers often rely on peers. And so we thought, okay, what's the, you know, the best way to short circuit that effort, which is traditionally pretty ad hoc, is to go and talk to these buyers themselves. And we do these, we'll call them 20 to 40 minute interviews with a software buyer to understand their experience. And so if you take all of those inputs and you smash them together, you can do really interesting things. And that's what helps us generate a lot of the data on our platform, a lot of the you know, search capabilities that we have, and then a lot of the research that we generate. And it because we're doing so much of it using technology, we don't have to have an analyst in the mix on every single market doing every single part of it. So we can have this sort of very thin human layer that lets us kind of blow out the number of markets. And so if you think about a Gartner, for instance, you know, they'll have 150-ish magic quadrants, right? We just crossed a thousand technology markets. We think there's probably in the neighborhood of three to 4,000 end technology markets that people care about. And so we can just infinitely scale as long as we continue to be able to acquire more data and qualitative information about companies and markets. Yeah. So you have a standardized way of, of collecting data. How many SKUs do you offer for the businesses? And like how standard or custom is the offering? It's pretty standard. So what we really think of it as we have two SKUs. So we have CB Insights, which is the first product. We launched in late last year, a product called Yardstick, which you can buy separately, which is the transcripts of the conversations with software buyers. 
and then you can bundle them those two together. So those are really the two independent products we have at this point. Within CB Insights, we have what we call modules. So if you want access to what we call business relationship data, or if you want access to patents, or you want access to the analyst briefings, which is the company submitted data, that'll move you up the, the kind of pricing ladder. It's all kind of baked into one product. It's just a matter of us determining what you as a customer need and where we can add value and then figuring out what we need to toggle on and off for you. Beyond that, there's not really any customization for customers beyond sort of the capabilities level customization. Obviously, our conversations with you and our client success team are then customized to your needs, but that's just to make sure you're successful on the product. So when you're selling the CB Insights product, are people... Is the use case that they usually have, hey, I want to buy a company in the space. I need to know which one or I need to evaluate a specific company. And I I know I need to do something in the space. Help me figure out what I should do. Yeah, again, like back to the earlier point, it really varies by the maturity of the organization. So I'd say like enterprises in particular, um, they really come in at different levels of maturity. And sometimes like they could be very mature in their understanding of, let's say, cybersecurity, but they're really immature in their understanding of AML, KYC, right? And so again, like uh, the idea here is they're making a series of technology decisions over the course of a year, and we just want to meet them where they are, right? I'd say if we're talking to a corp dev team or an investment firm, their circle of life is a little bit more structured, right? Let's take an investor, it's see the deal, assess the deal, win the deal, nurture the deal, and that's what they need to do. And so for them... Our goal is to just make sure that they have the tools they need to do whatever whatever step of the process they're at. So if they're, you know, they have a company they like and they're more at the assessment phase and want to understand valuations and comps and, you know, how companies stack up with one another, they can do that. Um, but yeah, there's not a sort of a single type of customer that we have. And I'd say even within a customer, their needs will vary day to day and week to week. Yeah. And when did you kind of... Um settle or solidify this business model. Take us through a little bit of the evolution of, uh, of of CB Insights. Yeah, absolutely. I think of us in like being in the third chapter of the company, right? So first chapter, I'd worked in venture and M&A before, and I, we used to use products from Dow Jones and Thompson, and I never really liked those products, right? And so I thought, I always want to do something entrepreneurial. Let me go solve the problem. The problem, like, you know, the most basic level was we bought these expensive subscriptions and then we'd go and Google to make sure, right? And it's like, well, why if we're paying for this service, why is my team still having to Google? Right. Um, so that we could build a better mousetrap, you know, information becoming more available. So it was very focused on what we call the deal maker segment. So think of VCs, growth equity, private equity, investment bankers, corp dev. Um, we were bootstrapped for the first six years. And so the benefit of that was you talk to every customer who signs up. And what ended up, we started seeing enterprises signing up, but not from their deal teams. It was their innovation, digital transformation product, like a whole pretty eclectic group. And when we talked to them, they said, we're not necessarily looking to do a deal in the way that CB Insights thinks. We think of these companies as one, a leading indicator of where tech is going, and we just need to be on top of that. And two, we think of them as future partners and vendors. And so... That was an interesting thing because, you know, when I worked at American Express before, we probably bought 90% of our technology from 10 companies. It was like IBM, HP, Microsoft, right? And what enterprises were telling us was that the sell side's actually a lot more fragmented now. It's not just them. So that was insight one, which sort of drove us into chapter two, which was let's go after this enterprise segment in addition to the deal makers. And then what we also observed was IT wasn't the only tech buyer it was actually becoming much more fragmented on the buy side as well. And so then the epiphany was, well, okay, if you've got fragmentation on both the buy and the sell side, you know, and it's just, it's getting increasingly messy. Can we build this conduit that actually connects both sides? And so that was chapter two, we started building up the buy side. Um, and then chapter three, which is the last two years has been the sell side coming to us after realizing we have a lot of the buy side on board and then the newsletters kind of has a following and a lot of people want to be in it. They started saying, hey, how do I, can we give you data? And the funny thing was in probably six years ago, we reached out to all these companies to say, hey, give us your data. And they like 
just told us to go pound sand, basically. They like didn't respond at all. And so it was a good learning and enlightened self-interest makes the world go around. And now that the company saw that we actually could be additive to their brand building, their customer acquisition, their potential investment, you know, raising their profile in front of investors in Corp Dev, they become more willing. And there's, you know, absolutely nothing. That's just the way the world goes around. I think we finally, we finally crossed the threshold where we could be useful to them. And so now we have tens of thousands of companies who submit data to us. And so chapter three is like getting that flywheel going. Um, And then, you know, we think ultimately there's probably ways to add value to the vendor side. We don't really monetize that today. We're really very focused on what we call the buy side. But yeah, that's kind of where we're at. So it's, it's been pretty consistent, I would say, in the sense of it's data and, you know, sort of quantitative and qualitative information's always been at the core of what we do. It's really been, I think, an understanding of a better understanding of who our market is um, and evolving with their needs and trying to solve problems for them. What data is most helpful for you to collect or you aspire to be collecting? So if I think of our world on two axes, there's breadth of data, which is, you know, do we track all the companies that are, that matter, right? And so there, there's a lot of data providers. And I think, you know, we'll go head to head with any of them. On the other axis, it's deep proprietary qualitative information. And you'd put your industry analysts and expert networks there, but they don't cover lots of companies. So they're low breadth, high depth, right? We think the opportunity is to be just to do both, right? Is to cover all the companies that matter and then using technology actually have really deep coverage. And so today our focus, you know, I think we have good baseline kind of core data on pretty much every company that matters. Our goal now is how do we go deeper on those companies? And so software buyer interviews, there's gold in there. And so you can think of those as highly unstructured documents, but we are using a lot of AI and ML to extract intent to renew price points, deployment time. So we can actually get a lot of structured data out of unstructured sources like a software buyer interview. Same with the the analyst briefings that companies do. So for us, it's now anything that's proprietary that ultimately, and you know, we don't want data just for the sake of data. So it's really important that any data set that we try to go after in the future helps our customers make a more quick and confident decisions. But yeah, like we're looking for now, like messy off the grid data more and more, because I think that's where moats are going to be built. And, you know, actually I think with like generative AI, I think proprietary data actually just jumped in value that much more because kind of everything else that's public is just going to be in these LLMs publicly anyways. So what are other examples of, of, of that? Like if you could get access to any sort of messy data that would advance your moat even further, what could that look like? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think we're, candidly, we're not spending a lot of time thinking about new data sets right now, just because I think we've got a lot of stuff that we've got to exploit, right? I think understanding the technology stack of really large companies, right? So I'm not talking about like what you can crawl off of like somebody's view HTML source, right? Like really talking about the, the guts of their tech stack. I think that could be interesting, understanding what they're paying, which we're getting now through the software buy interviews, but actually, you know, enterprise software is all like configured differently. So getting into the weeds of their contract terms, I think could be really interesting. Like a a large bank and, you know, Eric, you and I have kind of grown up in the startup world where people just try to pick the best technology. At a large bank, you're actually looking for uncertainty reduction more than you are necessarily the best technology all the time, right? And so knowing which peers of yours use this software? In what ways do they use it? You know, how did they price it? What modules, what capabilities did they get? So anything that gets us closer to understanding that, I think is really helpful. And then I think there's other things that we can do. There's workflow that we might think about layering on CBI. So, you know, technology decisions at big companies are increasingly a team sport. And so how do we actually help them collaborate with one another? So I think there's data and then there's maybe a bit of workflow. There. But again, nothing in the, in the near term, it's like just keep is do better what we're doing. And probably one, one of my big lessons learned in building the company is if I could have a do over is, you know, more narrowing the scope and increasing the quality on what we do versus trying to do a lot of things kind of superficially well. Right. I'm curious for the things that you, you, disco- you dropped uh, if you start like one of them, I believe was conferences and events. Yeah. 
maybe, maybe talk about what, what led to that decision. Cause it, it, you guys put on some great events, had some great speakers, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we did some really high end events and, you know, they were great, I think from a brand building perspective, we also ran into the buzzsaw of COVID. And so that made it maybe it, it probably made it a bit easier, right? Ultimately, like we try to be pretty data driven at the company. And so we looked at, okay, do people who attend the event, do they close at a higher rate, right? Because we didn't want to be an events company. We thought we could build, yeah. build a profitable events kind of business that would feed the beast, right? And when we looked at the data, it wasn't conclusive to us that people were closing at a higher rate or retaining at a higher rate by virtue of attendance at the event. And then the folks that were retaining, those tended to already be the people who loved us, right? So it was unclear that, well, was this, a, was this that additive? And, and events, have, you know, as you've probably done them, are, they're not a trivial effort to do well. And we're really good at technology. We're really good at data. I would say like we're probably like, a, you know, we were a solid B at events and community. And so it was a little bit of just leaning into to what we're good at. We launched a CB Insights for sales like many years ago because we thought people could use us for sales. And that was another example of being distracted by the shiny object, right? Like the TAM we have in the existing functions I mentioned is massive. Why don't we figure out what to sell, sell more into them versus trying to go after this new, this new ICP. And so, yeah, I think like those are just errors of commission, you know, that yeah. we've had in the past that I've, you know, again, coulda, shoulda, woulda. To that end, when you, when you think about your phase four or in the future, is, is it more ways, is it doing the same thing you're doing now, but serving more customers? Is it more modules to serve existing customers even better? Or like, how, how do you think about the future of CV Insights? Yeah, I think a lot of it will come down to customizing. So CBI is a pretty horizontal platform, right? And so when somebody comes on who's from a hospital system or somebody comes on from financial services, I think we can do a better job of making it feel really tailor-made for them, right? And so I think that's a big opportunity. I think the stuff with generative AI is is certainly like, you know, I, you go from a, if you CBI at its core, sort of a vertical search engine, right? And so the idea of going from point and click faceted search to asking a question and layering all of, you know, layering, giving you an answer. So almost becoming this programmatic analyst, right? I think like that's really where this is going. And so, and so you just ask us a question and we have all this qualitative and quantitative information that's not available anywhere else that we can then offer you, again, maybe not the answer, but probably cut an incredible amount of time out of your effort to get to a conclusion. So I think that's probably the biggest area. And then we'd look at whether organically or inorganically acquiring you know, new proprietary information and data sets or workflow and other things. But yeah, I don't think there's like any new big grand thing that we need to do. Actually, like, you know, we preach this to the team a lot. Like it's an execution game right now for us. Like the yeah. opportunity is there. We just need to keep executing better and better over time. And and what's an example, even directionally, like high, or high level of like a data set that you would want to acquire if, if, any, if you could acquire an, an, anyone like that would be additive or complementary? There's nothing that jumps out right now, right? I think like if I if I could, I'll give you an example. So Yardstick, right? We'd love to have interviews across those thousand technology markets and across the top 10 players in each of those, right? If there is a challenge or if there's an opportunity for us, it's what we talk about a lot internally is increasing density of coverage, right? And so how do we do that, right, is probably the number one thing that we're thinking about today, which is, you know, if I come in, we have a customer who wants supply chain visibility, we should have coverage there. If they want to cover AI to read radiology images, we have coverage there. So that's, if there's anything, and so we think we can solve that using technology really thoughtfully. And once we get that many transcripts, like the amount of metadata baked into those is remarkable, right? You can get a sense for how healthy a company is based on sort of the renewal part of that conversation and the value to an investor, the value to an IT buyer, the value to an M&A team of knowing that at that level of precision is quite profound. So yeah, I'd say like we just need to do more of what we're doing versus like going and chasing right. some new kind of new thing that we don't have today. Does that require a lot of manpower in terms of having all those conversations? 
or are you creating a marketplace where you're like, you don't um, employ the people who are having the conversation? How does the team look like for that? Yeah. So what we are, I'm going to be a bit cryptic here and I sure. apologize in advance. Okay. So uh, in general, the way we approach our problems is we'll do it in the beginning with humans and we'll try to validate that there's actually a market pull and need for that thing we've built, right? So I'll take market maps. Like market maps we started doing many years ago. People like them. And we said, okay, let's, but it, they're actually like, you know, if, if you've, you've built them, I'm sure, right? Like the simplest things, like I need to add a new logo into this market map. Like now you're doing this Tetris game of resizing every logo, right? And then you know, you think about it, like some of the smartest people of the next generation are on Google Images looking for logos, right? And so we said, let's just go build a market map maker. We only did it after we knew it worked, right? We do these um, two by twos of vendors. Again, we did those with humans in the beginning, and then we programmatically attack that. The same thing with transcripts. So we did and continue to do a lot of them with you know human analysts, and that'll always be the case. But we're always thinking about what are the ways we can reduce the effort there? So what we basically did was we deconstructed the process of an interview, right? And we said, okay, part of it is identifying the buyer. Part of it is scheduling. Part of it is like, you know, and there's all these steps. And we just said, okay, what can we use technology to do? And so I think we're like on the cusp of bringing the effort and ultimately the cost down by 90% on that. I won't go into kind of a secret sauce there, but if we do that, we can scale this thing like to the moon. So that's a lot of our focus, nail it in a non-technology driven way and then scale it using technology. And that's worked for us in the past. And so we're just repeating that with, with Yardstick and the transcript business. Are there other companies, like let's say PAVE, for example, that does compensation data or even a micro acquire, I guess that, you know, built a marketplace of like, are, are there companies like that where you're like, we could have done that or, or we should have done that. Or are you like, well, we could have, but it would have been a distraction. Like, how, how do you think about that? Yeah, it, it's funny you ask. So I think if you'd asked me that question five years ago, I would have been like, we should have done that. We should have <laughs> yeah. done that, right? I think now, like, there's just this narrowing the scope, increasing the quality. There's just a, there's magic in that. So a pave or somebody, right? Like, we we should be a partner to them, right? They should be using our API. And so I think... Now, increasingly, we think about with our API, um, you know, somebody like a few years ago, we got on this thing of we should get into supply chain visibility, right? And I think we have really interesting data and we can tell you what vendors are doing well and what which ones aren't. And it was like, that would have been a distraction. But I think our data, we should go find and are finding the players in that space. And then we should be an ingredient into their products and then structure a deal that as we make and hopefully help them become more successful, we're rewarded. So I think there's ways for us to play in these markets without actually being the the originator of the product. Yeah. And so, you know, hopefully sort of we can, we can kind of let a thousand flowers bloom that way. Um, and so today I think it's like we've, you know, we've got a big TAM. We're still maybe 2% penetrated of it. Like let's go and capture that and then figure out how to partner really well with others. And so I think that's a lot of our focus at present. And what's your litmus test to determine whether this is worth focusing on? Is it like, does this help enterprises make better purchasing decisions? Or like, what is the question that, you know? Does? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's tends to be two things, right? For our existing customers, is it going to help them do their jobs better, right? And that's not from like an altruistic like perspective, yeah. right? If we do that, it's going to drive up ACV, it's going to drive up uh, net retention, it's going to drive up gross retention. When we look at things through that lens, that makes sure we don't just launch products for the sake of launching them. We have to look at, okay, or does it improve margins? Those are probably like the four metrics now we're looking at from a product perspective. And then when we think about partnerships and like the API, it's sort of like an effort versus impact kind of thing. So if somebody can just buy our API and be off to the races. And as they're consuming more, we're getting paid more. So we're sort of aligned interest-wise. That's great. Sometimes with partnership discussions, it's like, hey, we have to do some really bespoke thing and it's a big effort. And there we just need to look at um, what's the size of the prize here. Like, it, let's just assume things go really well. Is this going to be a needle mover for us? As the company gets bigger, like the bar for what's a needle mover keeps going up. And so 
that's, you know, there's, there's always that challenge of like, well, we still got to leave some room for some like weird experiments. Um, and so we still do that again with the view that if this weird experiment goes well, um, could it be big one day? Right. And so that's, I think that tends to be, yeah, that those are probably the lenses we look at things yeah. through, I would say. So is it fair to say that on one element of your, one element of your business, you have the sort of top of funnel content engine that helps drive this data platform. It's almost in a very different way what TechCrunch was for Crunchbase. And maybe the data part competes with a pitch book or Crunchbase or any of these players. And then on the other side, you also maybe compete. And I'm not as familiar with the, these business, but like a Gartner or a G2 or like, like, how do you situate yourself into, you know, who are the players that you compete with or, or overlap? Yeah. So I think on the, on the breadth of data front, right, which is the, you know, who covers a lot of companies, right? I think you're Pitch books, your cap IQ would be in that world. Fact sets sort of come into this data world, a little private company data world. So we're there on the depth of information, right? I think I would put your Gartners or your Gerson Lehrman groups, you know, your expert networks there. Um, I think, you know, G2 is a great company. I think we're probably to some degree both, you know, attacking Gartner, but just from different ends, right? I'd say like, we focus on what we call high consideration software. So like the KYC AML stuff, right? The hospital that needs AI to read radiology images. And I think G2 focuses on a different segment, but yeah, I wouldn't say we run into them, but yeah, that would be, those would be the two bookends. And then again, our view is like, if we have the most breadth and the most depth, that's where there's sort of a white space in this market. So, so hospitals come to you and ask, what technology should we be using to advance our business, basically? Yeah. I mean, they can come sometimes with that broad of a mandate, right? Or sometimes they can say, hey, listen, we've been seeing all this about AI and radiology. We'd like to bring that into our organization. The challenge for us is that there's over 100 companies doing this. And so because of all this noise, our decision usually is just indecision because we don't have time to go evaluate 100 companies. So can you just tell us like the three to put into our RFP and then give us questions that we should go and ask them and tell us who are the other hospital systems that are our peers that use them and help us hear what those peers are saying about those companies. Right. And so, yeah. So again, like the on-ramp for a hospital system could be very different because they all come in different so strides. Th this is what a company like Sacra is also trying to get into, right? Basically like private analysis of companies at scale. I know Sacra a little bit. I think the big thing here will be for us is, generating the analysis ourselves is actually, that's where you run into the scale constraint of you need really smart people interpreting information all the time, right? In the case of the transcripts, like that is sort of, in, again, is if we figure out how to reduce the cost and the time to do these, yeah. it scales very significantly. And then we can extract out from that, hey, here's a vendor scorecard for the AI and radiology images by talking to 50 customers of that. And so we can just more programmatically attack this, right? And so I think yeah. like the Gartners of the world are constrained there. They're like analog marketplaces, right? They just, instead of having technology in the middle, they have a person. And that person is like a town crier who shares a little bit of information with vendors and a little bit with the buyers and they're sort of credible. It just, when there's 3000 tech markets to cover, they just can't do it. So I think any model that's inherently driven by human analysts in the mix is going to have a constraint in this new world of unlimited new technology totally. markets cropping up. Yeah. That's why getting transcripts from expert calls is so interesting because these are calls that they are already having. It's You're not creating new behavior and you're just able to use the exhaust or whatever to sort of, you know, um, share that to a broader audience or package it. And yeah. there, there are two other examples of behaviors that happen um, a lot that I'm curious if people could figure out a way to record and also package. Yeah. One is reference checks on yeah. individuals. Yeah. Um, you know, how many times have, have we both referenced the same people who worked for us, you know, and that information is so valuable, right? The other is maybe like startup pitches or uh, like investors talking amongst each other, like investors are all diligencing the same deals. <laughs> if there was a way to almost like a give to get way of like, Hey, here's my thoughts on it. And I'll get, you know, your, your broader thoughts on it. I'm curious for your perspective on, on both of those and whether you think either of them has real potential to be a, to build a business on top of it. 
Yes, yeah, so let me take the second one, the investor pitch one. That one, I guess I'm a little more pessimistic on, right? And I think the reason for that is the time to know whether you made the right call or not, there's just a really big time lag, right? And so it's really hard to prove that this collaborative diligence effort is actually generating better results for me because the lag is so significant, right? Like if there was, and I think people are trying to do this in the public markets, right? There you have a scorecard at the end of every day, right? And so it's a lot easier to just say like, hey, this was a good, this was a good call. This was a bad call, right? If I invest in a company and with like IPO and M&A windows being protracted, I'm looking at seven to 10 years, right? I think you've got that. And then I think there's a lot of peculiar behavior in the private investment world where everybody thinks they're a master of the universe and the smartest person in the world. And so I'm not, sh I guess the other thing I'd worry about is you end up with adverse selection in the people who opt into this pool, right? It's like, well, the people who are the, the quote smartest, and there are some actually just genuinely just smarter people in this world um, who have better access and just better instincts. They're probably not going to opt into this. And so then do you end up with like, all the folks who are sort of, you know, like uh, the second tier, like the JV squad, right? And like, so I think that's a challenge there. I, the first idea I like, just because like I feel this pain, right, a lot more. I'll give you, I'll come back to it. I'll give you the version of it on people that I think is actually maybe more interesting, which Please. is when somebody leaves an organization, it's actually very hard to understand, it's like, you know, businesses, we do it as a business win loss reporting when we win or lose a deal. Yep. Right. I think that applied to talent at organizations could be interesting because when somebody leaves, generally they want to leave on good terms. And so they tend to be very polite about why they left. And so you kind of have to do all this divining of why they actually left because they're, they're trying to be respectful yep. and they don't want to throw somebody under a bus and all that good stuff. And that's all like, that's a sign of a professional, but you don't leave those conversations sometimes with the root cause of what led them to leave, right? And so it becomes hard to become a better organization over time because, or it's harder than it should be, I would say, because you don't really get to ground truth on like, they left because their manager was not guiding them. They left because the systems that they had to operate under were just terrible and we didn't seem to invest, whatever it might be. There's a lot of those decisions or a lot of those things that happen on a regular basis, right? So when I look at a business, the frequency with which you feel that pain, I think becomes really important. And so if I go back to references, references, I think are at, um, like there, there's different stakes, right? Like an executive is when you just, you you know, you're like, Hey, this person's going to run a hundred person org in my company. It's really important. I get this right. Because if they mess up, it could like create this cancerous thing that, Right. But you don't make those decisions that frequently. Right. Versus a, you know, I'm hiring a junior accountant. Right. Like I'm not maybe making that decision frequently, but like the stakes of that decision are also lesser. And so on the reference one, it's this thing between frequency of decision and average order value. Right. Like the stakes. Right. And so highly infrequent, high stakes. Yeah. You know, how do you, how much can you get paid for that is the thing that I'm right. unsure of. I think it solves a problem. I'm completely spitballing here. I'm just not sure is, you know, is that a, something that people will pay a high price for? And then will they do it in a way that leads to like revenue predictability? Is that more of a service or is that like a subscription, right? And like yeah. I love subscriptions and I'm not sure like, yeah, every time we hire an exec, we'd love to use your service because it seems like you do really good work you know, sure, I'd do that. I don't know if I'd pay a lot for that on an annual basis because I might need to hire two execs this year and then I might not need to hire anybody for the next 18 months. So, Right. I think just zooming out, I wonder, do you believe that reputation will be put on the internet um, in some way that is not going to be perfect, but is going to be more insightful than we have today? Like people check our LinkedIn's every day for some combination of reasons, right? They want to get in touch with us. They want to evaluate us, you know, get a sense for what we've done in our careers. They might want to know who we know. I don't know. A number of reasons why people might check our LinkedIn profile, Yeah, but it doesn't really say like what people think, think about us in a more detailed way. And people do business with us all like they, they want to know that information. Do you think that will be put on the internet in a centralized way? 
That'd yeah, cool. I do think it'll happen. I think it's probably like the combination of a few different things, right? Like the company that I always am like, I feel this company was too early was clout. Yeah. Right. And totally. so like, I think clout in some form comes back, right? I think it was just too early and, and, you know, maybe some other things that I'm not privy to that happen. Um, you know, but I don't know if it's what people say about you. Cause I, I think that's a, like dribble is another example or like, you know, like, I think it's like, your work product and ways of displaying that I think can say a lot about you. And maybe in, in design, it's obviously an easier thing to do than somebody who's in RevOps or, you know, an AE, right. But an AE who has hit quota, you know, everywhere they've went and they've sold the challenger brand and, you know, like an AE who it's, you know, their quota at Google, I'm sure that's somewhat hard, but like selling a monopoly is probably not that hard, yeah. right. <laughs> if you're selling a challenger brand and you're done well, like, Okay, that's interesting. So I wonder if there's a a portfolio view, right? And then maybe there's commentary built on, right? I just, I don't know. I, I feel like, you know, you see like the Yelps and glass doors of the world, like the disaffected and the unhappy tend to be there most. And so, you know, if you and I work together, Eric, and I thought you were the best thing ever, I'm not, what's the incentive for me to go help you out? I mean, for buddies, sure. Yeah. But if, if it's a little bit more of a boss, you know, employee relationship, but, you know, if you were a terrible employee, maybe even then, like, I'd probably be worried about litigation and other things. Yeah. So, yeah, I think a, a score for an individual of some type is going to happen. I just wonder if it'll be built off of maybe reviews is one element, but it's off of like accomplishments and work product in some yeah. form. Yeah, I think that could be interesting. I think like the other thing is like attribution right? Like we see this in our world, like a VC does a deal, but like a bunch of other people were involved in it, but like really the only the headline partner gets the, gets the credit. Right. And so like s methods of giving attribution to other people that sprinkles some of the credit yeah. around, I think could be an interesting thing. And I think like, there's probably like some employer branding type thing you could do around that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, something's totally. going to happen here. I just don't know. I've got stronger inclinations on other ways than reviews, I guess. Totally. Yeah. That's a good brainstorm. Um, zooming on again, I'm, I'm curious what kinds of business media businesses you think should actually primarily be wedges to data businesses. Um, you know, I, I believe there's one in trucking that, that got really, that's gotten pretty big. Freight uh, waves. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And then on a much smaller scale, there, there's this guy, uh, Nathan Latka, who has interviewed like 3000 SaaS founders and, and some people question the way he's, he's done it, but the yeah. format of you know, interviewing people and then collecting data and using some of that, packaging it something privately, something I, I think about as I'm building this podcast, whether I should also be thinking about it being a, some sort of data business as well. What's your general advice to media entrepreneurs who are thinking, Hey, should this also be a data business? What, what's the way to think about it? Yeah. I, um, Yes. Um, you know, like I, I get, I think of everything in like data business terms, right? Like I'm always looking at something and that's just the way my mind is wired and it's a bit of a sickness probably. Um, <laughs> I, I think the key there and I like what Nathan has done, I, you know, I love his hustle and, and like, so I, I, you know, appreciate what he's done. Um, you know, uh, freight waves. I, I think like going again, beating this old drum of narrowing the scope and increasing the quality. Right. And so if I did do CBI or build something like CBI again today, like the world's quite different. Like we had some benefits early days where like there wasn't as much content and we could stand out. Now it's not like that. I'd go like hyper vertical, right? So I'd say like, okay, we're going to know the most about cybersecurity companies. And even in that, I'd probably niche down further to start and then like knock that bowling pin down and then go broader and broader and broader. I think with data companies is depth of information on something that, some group will benefit a lot from having access to, right? So I think narrowing the scope is really important. And the other thing I would think a lot about is like, how do you build, I guess, what people used to call data cooperatives or collaborative data models, which is, you know, can you go get, let's take HR tech. We're going to go build the best source of data on HR tech and build a media company around that. Can you go get data about their price points, what they pay their teams and like, you know, what's a, uh, designer and an exec and all these different people paid and like, you know, and then you could go back to them and say, here's anonymized 
companies that are similar scale to you in HR, here's their price point, here's their cost structure. And I'd actually not do all of these things. I'd pick one kind of P&L line item and go deep on that. And then from there, you build that wedge, right? And so you're like, okay, now we have the best data on HR tech companies. And now those companies to get that benchmarking data or whatever it is, are going to have to keep giving you data, right? And so you build that model there and then you can either go to what's the next adjacent area to HR tech, right? Like maybe there's some cousin of it that the people who buy HR tech tend to also buy regulatory and compliance. And so you're like, okay, we'll go there. And so I think you can keep expanding out from there, but I think it's go deep and go narrow to start. Pick a vertical that people have money in, right? That's what I think is interesting. I was talking to a company last week that is is doing something in construction, right? In construction, like materials. And, you know, like, again, we talked about like, okay, go really niche. Become the best supplier of that material in Scottsdale, Arizona, right? You're the only person doing this material in this location. And maybe for this particular, not for the, you know, homeowner, but for construction companies, right? And so you build that and then you go from there. So I think that's the way you get a wedge into a market is by approaching it in that really disciplined way. And so in terms of how to get that data, like my instinct, I feel like it's too non-scalable. Like for the HR thing, what I would say is, okay, let's start a podcast. Let's interview a bunch of HR people and then ask them those questions. Or for cybersecurity, I'd say like, maybe let's start covering fundraising announcements from cybersecurity companies. And then when we're covering them in a fundraise, we could also ask them for, you know, other kinds of information that that might be helpful. I suspect you'd have more scalable and programmatic ways of acquiring that data or. No, no, I think that's actually the right model, right? I think you do that. I think the key though is the concurrently I'd go talk to either like, so the cybersecurity, you can go talk to the companies and say like, Hey, if I had this data about your peers, like which of these would help your product team or your rev ops team or your chief revenue officer. So you know, I think I see a lot of folks go and acquire data and then hope to figure out the customer later. I think you got to go right up front and have a view on who the customer is. So is the customer the cybersecurity company? Is it buyers of cybersecurity technology? You can go get a little bit of data and say, hey, here's what we can do for you. And then just go validate that somebody wants to pay for that. Right. And so then if they're like, well, I really like data points one, two, and five, but I don't care about three and four then that tells you what to ask in your subsequent conversations, right? Like, okay, let me just focus on one, two, and five and add data point six and seven. Um, And then, you know, like ask people like, hey, you know, hey, I'm going to launch this quarterly benchmarking thing. Here's what it costs. You know, if you want it early access, like you can pay me one half of what I think it's going to cost and see if folks are actually going to spend. But I, I love... Yeah, I think podcasts, I mean, we, we haven't really explored them, but I think it's like potentially a really interesting way of, of building up a data set. I just caution against like, hey, I need to have every cybersecurity or HR tech company's data to be credible. Like you can take a sample and sort of weave up, you know, you got to sell the dream and, and then folks will, if they are into what you're bringing, like then they'll buy and then you go and blow that out. And then you can think about scalable systems. And I think once you've got that little bit of that flywheel turning, then you can put tech behind it and say, Hey, give us your data. And you might actually get on the podcast, yeah. right? So you actually reverse it because now you're like, you're the best place where right. everybody who buys HR tech comes to. And so now the vendors are like, I got to go to Eric because he's like the place right. where all the buyers show up. Right. And so I think like some degree, that's the model we've accidentally built. The do over would be to just do that much more consciously than we did. Totally. So if you were starting it again today, you'd pick a, pick a niche, go maybe even more niche than you think. And you'd pick maybe a buyer within that niche and kind of architect the data product working backwards from like, Hey, is this thing valuable for you? I could put together like an experiment, you know, what would you pay for it, et cetera. Yeah. I, yeah. I'd narrow the scope to one very specific vertical. I'd focus on building some sort of contributory data or co-op model where you build a flywheel of getting data directly from the people that you cover And then I hate to throw it out there because it's the fashionable thing, but then I would think about what role the generative AI stuff plays in it, because I think the world of data is going to move from pointing and clicking via faceted search into something that is people are going to, people are going to interrogate the data using natural language. I'd think about that in the future, but those would be like the three things I'd probably look at. Maybe gearing towards closing, just one example, like if you were 
20 minute VC and we can pick a different example if easier. I'm curious, like, how would you think about building a data business on top of an already existing, you know, pretty big influential podcast that's only focused on media today? Yeah. So I think what Harry's done is really, I mean, it's friggin' remarkable. I would say like, it's, it's pretty horizontal, right? And so I think that's the, the challenge if he were to continue there is this, like, you know, he's talking to a D to C company and then a grocery delivery and then a yep. SaaS founder and just it's they're very variable and so those businesses don't look like each other so you know I think if Harry or the guys at my first million had deep dives on specific areas or you know what what Sam's doing with Hampton yep. hey I've got a bunch of access to D2C founders okay I bet you they want to know what their peers are paying in customer acquisition, but even that's not that useful because if I'm selling, you know, women's clothing versus deodorant, it's very different. So can I sub-segment that? And so I think, yeah, just niching down in some way, it's probably more challenging to start broad and to niche down, right? Because like you now, you're going to potentially alienate a bunch of readers and listeners and viewers who are used to you covering all sorts of stuff. So it might be hard to retrofit that, but maybe you could launch adjacent sub brands or something. But I think starting out, that's like the opportunity for an entrepreneur is like they don't have they don't have this incumbency kind of challenge, right? Like yeah. they, they're starting from zero. And so they can just go whip up the first one. And like I think Sean at Industry Dive is like not in the data world, but like his model, like he nailed it in one place and then yeah. just kept and I'm oversimplifying because he's just a yeah. ridiculously good operator. But then he just stamped that thing out across vertical after vertical to some degree. Like that's the playbook in the data world that I think could be really compelling. Yeah. Well, th that's a good place to wrap because a lot of media entrepreneurs are thinking about how to also become data companies because they're better businesses in, in many ways. You've given a lot of insight here into how they can think about it and how you've thought about it with CB Insights. So Anand, thank you so much for coming to the podcast and sharing your learnings with us. Cool. Thanks, Eric. Riverside is a presenting sponsor of Media Empires. It's an essential part of our tech stack. Riverside makes scaling a media business possible for us and so many podcasters and creators. It's our online recording studio, not just for the show, but across the entire podcast network. Riverside lets us record interviews with the best guests from wherever they are in the world. Our team can also cut short form clips directly from Riverside. Because as any listener of this show knows, you create once and then publish everywhere. Sign up for Riverside.fm today by following the link in the description box and use our code Media Empires to get a 20% discount.